PilotSafety.org is a volunteer group dedicated to reducing general aviation accidents by providing free and low-cost safety training for pilots. Learn more now at PilotSafety.org. Our speaker today is Gary Reeves. He volunteers as a Young Eagles flight leader for the EAA. Gary has over 6,000 hours, is an ATP and a master flight, instrument, and multi-engine instructor. Of the 112,000 instructors in the U.S., less than 800 have ever been named master instructor. Gary is one of only 13 to have earned this designation in California. He is a nationally recognized expert in Avidyne and Garmin avionics, FlyQ, for flight, and instrument flying. In May 2016, Avidyne selected Gary Reeves and Pilot Safety as their national training provider. In 2016, Gary was awarded the FAA Instructor of the Year for the Western Pacific region, which includes Arizona, California, Hawaii, and Nevada. This means he is one of the top eight instructors in the whole country. Please welcome 2016 Western Pacific Regional Instructor of the Year and Master CFI, Gary Reeves. You know, no matter how many classes I do live and videos every year, that's still funny. So this is only chapter one, and we're going to go very, very fast. We're not going to cover anything in detail. This is a very broad overview. There are some important tips, but we're going to cover all the details, all the meat of exactly how to do every single function in chapters two through five. But it is important because we're going to cover several things. We're going to cover some really good basic concepts that you have to understand before you start. The buttons and knobs, they don't, there are only a few on the GTN, but it's important to know how to work them, and some basic general operations. Most of my master training videos, I try and focus on real in-flight use versus simulator. However, with the Garmin GTN, they've done such a great job with their iPad simulator, and it's got a feature that's really, really helpful you can actually see a silver circle where my finger is pushing so you know exactly where to push. For instance, if I want to push on the transponder, you'll see my finger push. You can watch me push three, two, six, seven, and touch enter. So during the videos, you're going to see a lot of simulator use so that you can learn exactly what button I'm pushing and it will make it easier on you to learn. Now, as with all our mastery training videos, you will see in-flight footage as well. But for learning the basics, the iPad simulator just works a little bit better so you don't have to guess where my finger's touching. So real quick, let's review a little bit about the GTN series. They were released in 2011. It says right on the first couple of pages of every owner's manual, you must use the touch screen for most features. That brings up the question, what about turbulence? And we're gonna talk about that. There are a lot of extra options. There are a lot of, would you like fries with that? You can add Jeppesen charts for a fee. You can add XM weather and radio, not only for an annual fee, but you do have to buy the Garmin data link. You can add a different Garmin data link for $4,000 and with the Garmin transponder will allow you to be fully ads be in and out compliant, including free weather and traffic, which I think is a much better deal than XM most of the time. Essentially, it's the same price for the Garmin data link, 
but the only difference between ADSB weather and XM weather is ADSB weather only shows within 400 nautical miles of your airplane. For most GA airplanes, that's fine, and it will also help you make the ADSB 2020 compliant. If you do fly a jet or a turboprop where your average flight is several hundred miles and you want to see something a thousand miles away, then you will need XM. Now it will also talk to only two programs on the iPad. It will talk to both Garmin Pilot and ForeFlight. Those are the most popular for this anyway. But again, you have to buy the FlightStream 210. So what's the difference between the 625, 650, 635? The 650 is the one with both VHF radio and ground-based VR localizer capability. A 625 is GPS only, and the 635 is GPS with radio, but not able to track a VR or localizer. So why would somebody buy a GTN 625? No radio, no VR or localizer capability. Well, they might have their plane where that's set up, where they already have two other radios, and they just need a GPS. If they get a lot of panel space, it might work for them. Same difference with the 725 and the 750. The 750, of course, includes both the radio and the VR localizer glide slope. So since it is 80% functions can only be worked by the touch screen, people ask me at national classes every day, Gary, are touch screens hard to work in turbulence? And the answer is, well, yeah. If you've ever tried to work an iPad or an iPhone in turbulence, they are hard. It is harder to work a touchscreen than something with a bunch of buttons and knobs. But Garmin's done something really smart to make it much, much better. Garmin's actually carved out the sides of the GTN and put a little ledge called the finger porch down on the bottom, where if you put your hand there to stabilize it, it's much, much easier to work even in moderate turbulence. So it's really not that bad as long as you know where to put your finger. Or you can put your fingers down on the little edge on the bottom and that stabilizes your hand. It's only really hard if your hand is free floating, not touching the sides or the bottom of the GTN. I will tell you, I myself have been guilty of this and many, many instructors have been guilty of saying, well, grab that bottom right knob and shove your, your webbing in there between your thumb and your forefinger. The only problem is, is when you do that, your fingers then tend to hit the direct to button by accident. So it's no longer my favorite technique. So real quick review of the GTN 750. The active comm frequency is always shown at the top in green. The standby comm frequency is a lighter blue on the bottom. The active nav frequency, top, bright green, standby is a light blue on the bottom. The button in the top left is your volume, checking your squelch, and using it to get a nav ident, like listening to a Morse code ident. A lot of radio failures around the country are actually caused by people transmitting, but having the volume down so they can't hear the other person. Before your first transmission of the day, I always recommend you hit squelch and adjust the volume in your headset. It also verifies your audio panel set correctly, which by the way, you can control remotely if you have a GMA35 right here through the audio panel controls. And if you have the remote Garmin transponder, you can control the transponder from the top as well. There's a home key on the right that you're going to push more than any other button combined. This is how you get to the functions and get back to the map. So get used to pushing this home key a lot and doing it repeatedly. You're going to have to push it twice for every single function. The photo sensor lets the GTN know if it's bright or dark inside the airplane. And if you have it set that way, it will automatically adjust the brightness of the screen. The SD card is where you're going to upload databases. That's what the home page actually looks like, and that's where all the functions are. You'll notice you no longer have chapters and pages you have a home page with a bunch of individual functions. Each of those function keys will control several different things. There's a direct to key, which does three things we'll talk about. The large and small knobs, that's what you can tune a radio with. 
You can control certain options in certain functions. You can flip-flop radio frequencies. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. And we have a locking screw on the bottom. That's where you pull it in and out with the Allen wrench if things break. We have enunciations that are important at the bottom. And there's always a little hint to what the big and the little knobs on the bottom right will do. The 650, pretty much the same, just a little bit smaller window. Same volume squelch, same function keys. Here's your home page, your active comm frequency, your standby comm frequency. Now you notice it won't display nav frequencies. You have to push that bottom right number in and that will change to nav. Much the way you would on a Garmin 430, by the way. Your home key, your photo sensor, Direct to, there's your rotary knobs, your same SD card. The message enunciation, instead of on the bottom left of the 750, is in the middle left on the 650. Your locking screw is the same, your enunciations are the same, and your hints on what the big and little knobs will do are always in the bottom right. And those change, by the way, as the functions change. Last thing is, is you can still control the transponder using the remote transponder capability, just like that. So the volume key works pretty much like every other volume key you've ever worked on a radio. Turn it right to make it louder, turn it left to make it softer, and push for the squelch, that's that volume test, and the nav ID. This is actually important, and I'll say it again during the instrument chapter. The GTN is very smart. It will identify legally a nav frequency for you. If it says Victorville VOR, it's identified, it's legal, you can use. I'd still like you to get in the habit of listening to the Morse code ident because most of you that buy a GTN will still eventually or occasionally fly older steam gauge airplanes and it's a good habit to stay into. And this is what I'm talking about. You can see on 109.05, it actually says Victorville VOR. That is legally identified. But again, I'd still like you to listen to the Morse code ident. It's just a good habit. More than any other button combined. Almost everything you need to do goes to the home button, then back, and, and so forth. So the home button actually brings up most of the controls. Now on the 750, it shows them all on one screen. On the 650, you'll have to scroll. So instance, if we want to put in a flight plan, and we'll put it to paradise, okay? Then we can touch back, or if we see the home button, if I press and hold that, that goes back to the map. So again, let's make a change. Let's go there. I want to display traffic. Okay. Well, no, I don't want to look at traffic. I want to look at terrain. No, I don't want to look at terrain. I want to load a procedure. So let's load a departure procedure from Long Beach, Anaheim 7, runway 25 right to Ventura, load departure, press and hold home, that goes back to the map, and if we zoom out, shows my departure procedure. So you'll repeatedly use the home button. Just remember, if you ever get lost, pressing and holding the home button takes you back to the map. Now, the home button on the 650 does all the same things, except it will not bring you back to the default map. The default screen on the Garmin 650 is not a map. Because it's a smaller screen, the default screen actually returns you to an OBS, and then you have to push a map button. So we're looking at utilities, there's trip planning, 
Well, okay, I'm done with my trip planning. Press and hold home, and it takes me back to an OBS. To see the map, I have to push the bottom right button that says Map. So because it's a small screen, I actually like the default navigation OBS screen better. Um, I prefer to look at something bigger. That's why we all bought an iPad with ForeFlight, or if you have a GTN 750, or a G500, or even an Aspen installed in the airplane, really using the 650 with the smaller screen, that is a better map, a better screen, especially for IFR use. Although, of course, you can zoom in and out on the map as much as you want. It is most useful for three separate functions. If we hit direct to once, we can go to any waypoint we'd like to dial in. For instance, if I want to go to the Hawthorne Airport, I can touch K, H, and you'll notice Fast Find finds that. Push the Activate button. Zoom out. I'm now direct Hawthorne. I can also direct to any waypoint in the current flight plan. For instance, if I want to go direct to the Paradise VOR, hit Activate, zoom out, and the one that's most useful, especially in an emergency, is if I push Direct to Nearest, I can select the nearest airport and activate Direct to that. Now when you power on your Garmin, you're going to see three separate splash screens. The first one is the copyright. The second one is where you can check that all your databases are current. And the third one is a panel self-test. So I'll show you all of these on the GTN 750 first. You'll get a copyright screen. and then two more very important screens. It will check the database for you. Any database that's not current, it will warn you that the database is not current. And a very important IFR self-test. Now the self-test is legally required before every flight in instrument rules or conditions. What I mean is, if you're filing IFR, you must do this test before every single flight. If you're going to pick up an IFR clearance, you must do this. A lot of owners skip these required self-tests, and that actually makes the navigation unit illegal for use in IFR. So what I want to show you is let's look at a self-test first with the Garmin 750 connected to a G500. You'll notice that it says, half left, no flag, half up, no flag, a TO2 indication, and the OBS should read 150. So, let's look over at the G500. And all of that is true. The needle is half left deflected. Don't get stuck on it being exactly halfway. It's usually just about a dot and a half, but that's the same on all units. We have a glide path about halfway up. We have a TO indication. And the OBS says 150 with no red X's, which would be their equivalent of a flag on the G500. The 650 is very similar, but I wanted to show you the 650 with a manual HSI. I'm sorry, not HSI, a manual OBS, just like any other VOR or ILS uh, steam gauge that you would see. Remember, half left, half up, a TO indication, and the OBS matches. Now you notice this OBS doesn't say 150, it says 024 with no flags. So let's see if that's true. Half left, half up, TO indication, and look, my OBS is set on 024. In fact, if I spin the OBS knob and reset it to a different course, you'll notice 
as I spin that, the self-test screen will update as well. All of these need to be true before you can legally use the units in IFR. Now, after you've confirmed everything's accurate, this is your chance to set the fuel on board and the fuel flow. And what I've set this up for is like a Piper Archer where it has tabs full and let's set that up. After you've completed your instrument self-test, you want to put the amount of fuel. Now, if your GTN is hooked up to a fuel computer, a lot of this will be done automatically. If not, let's set things up. So based on the Piper Archer, let's go to fuel on board and I want to put in full and tabs. Now it says 24 gallons usable per tank, 25 total. Well, you never want to use the total. You only want to use the usable fuel. So 24 gallons in each tank, I have two tanks, that would be 48 gallons. Except for a safety buffer, I'm always going to drop that 4 gallons. The fuel tab capacity, it says 17 gallons per tank for a total of 34. Remember, as a safety buffer, I'm always going to take off 4 and put 30. By underestimating the amount of fuel I actually have and overestimating the fuel burn, I'm never going to run out of gas. That's just a good safety buffer that I recommend every pilot use. Now when we go back, back, when we touch fuel on board, we can say it's to the tabs, we can say it's full, or if we measure with a dipstick, we can say exactly how many we have, which is maybe 18. Again, I would underestimate that and drop it to 14. Never overestimate. So let's just say it's completely full. Enter. Same thing on fuel flow. Now, if the cruise altitude says at full power, I'm going to burn 10 gallons an hour, just like I underestimate the fuel, I'm going to overestimate the fuel burn at 12. That takes into effect the climb, and again, it also gives you a nice safety buffer. Then I'll hit continue, and we'll move on from there. Updating your database is pretty much like updating every other Garmin on the planet. You're going to buy an SD card reader. You're going to sign up through Garmin. You're going to update your databases onto the SD card. You'll install it in the GTN. It'll automatically update when you click Update All. Now, any databases which are not up to date will automatically be installed. If some are already up to date, they'll just stay there. A lot of questions happen about database pricing. How much is it going to cost me? I promise you this, an up-to-date database is always cheaper than an insurance copay. So if you just have a single GTN and you buy your database from Garmin, it's about $500. If you have two GTNs, it's cheaper than buying two separate ones. And that would be like $7.99 if you have a $7.50 and a $6.50. The difference is the $6.50 will not display charts. The $7.50 displays either Garmin flight charts or Jeppesen flight charts if you're a fan of Jeppesen. Now, if you really want the Jeppesen charts, totally fine. You do have to pay Garmin a $1,000 unlock fee, and then you have to buy a separate database. If you want the whole US, it's $940. If you just want like the western half, which is what I have, it's $715. So question, true or false? You can legally fly IFR with an expired aviation database using the Garmin GTN. 100% true. If you can back it up with VORs, and of course you can't do GPS approaches. You can only do ground-based approaches, VORs, localizers, uh, SDFs, NDBs, PARs, that kind of stuff.
but it is really, really important after every time you update the database or if you're a renter and planning on using a GTN equipped plane or any Garmin or Avidyne equipped plane, you must check for nav data alerts. Garmin does not check that the data is accurate. Garmin puts the data in that the FAA gives to Garmin. Well, two weeks later, if the FAA goes, whoops, there was a problem, it's not really Garmin's fault. But it is legally required that you get all available information. That's part of 91103 before you go taken off into the clouds. Let me show you how to do that. Basically, you just go to fly.garmin.com. Then you're going to look over on the right and click on Aviation Database Alerts. You don't have to be a subscriber. Anybody, especially render pilots, can always do this. So we're going to click on that. And you'll notice there's an incorrect VOR Runway 22 procedure for Sierra Bravo Mike in Sheboygan County. If I click on that, it'll actually bring up a PDF alert. This is users of all Garmin Aviation products and Garmin Pilot, the iPad app. It was dated September 23rd, 2016. The procedure stored is incorrect. What happened was the FAA did not make an important database change so that the old procedure and the old chart was still put in, even though there's a new updated chart and procedure published effective September 15th. This is not Garmin's fault. It had nothing to do with Garmin. The FAA noticed it after the databases had already gone out. This happens to every aviation manufacturer. To view the chart, all you do is touch Home, Charts, we'll touch KLGB, and we'll change that to KSBM. Enter. We'll touch Approaches, and we're going to change that by scrolling up to the VOR22. We'll make it a full screen. And now if we zoom in at the bottom and we look at the chart date, you'll see it's actually an expired chart, 29 May 14. So if you look really closely, we look back at the PDF, there was a new updated chart published September 15th, and we are looking at an old expired chart. These are important things to know. We've seen nav data alerts where the MDA shown in Garmin, Avidyne, and other avionics manufacturers have been several hundred feet lower than the legal MDA on certain approaches. This is dangerous. And if you descend too low based on what a GTN tells you, it is your fault when you hit stuff, not Garmin, because Garmin publishes nav data alerts. You are legally required to check those every time. Now, you can control the audio panel from a 750 pretty easily, as long as you bought the remote audio panel from Garmin, the GMA35. Pretty simple to work. It's pretty easy to figure out, but let's go ahead and talk about it and talk about anything uh, I want to cover in specific features. To work the audio panel, pretty simple. Touch audio panel. Split mode is very cool for a two crew aircraft because the pilot can be monitoring ATC on COM1 and a good example is the co-pilot on COM2 can be calling ahead to the FBO or checking weather. Playback controls allow you to replay a clearance or a missed radio call. This is a feature that many avionics manufacturers add and I would like to really encourage you to never ever use it. As a professional pilot I will tell you it is much better 
much easier and much safer to ask air traffic control to say again or say again slower than to play back and re-listen while they're waiting for a response. So it's a neat feature um, if you're an instructor and you'd like to review stuff on the ground after a flight, but I really encourage all pilots not to use it uh, when they're talking to air traffic control live. So we'll touch back. Cabin speaker turns the speaker on. Of course, you can adjust the volume. Marker beacons on. High sensitivity, low sensitivity, and of course, you can set the marker beacon volume. Now, 3D audio is really, really cool. 3D audio on has some really neat features, and I'll cover that in just a second. If you touch intercom, anything with a green arrow, you'll hear each other. So if we say pilot and co-pilot can talk to each other, that's great, but the passengers can talk to each other, but the flight crew will not hear them. You can also hook them up just to one. You can hook up everybody. Or you can make the co-pilot a passenger too. And now everything the co-pilot hears, the passengers will automatically hear. You can also decide who gets the music. So the pilot gets the music and the co-pilot gets the music and the passenger gets the music, but the music, sorry, the music will be muted anytime a radio call comes in or anytime somebody says something on the intercom. If we hit back, same thing with telephone. We'll say, okay, only passengers get to use the telephone. And these are all options that can be hooked up when you install your Garmin. The other thing you can do is say, we're transmitting on mic one, but if we want to transmit on radio two, we just touch that. Or let's say we want to transmit on one, but we want to monitor the second radio as well to listen to an ATIS. Now this is where Garmin's done something really, really amazing, but you do have to pay for the GMA35, the remote audio panel. Garmin's done something amazing. Normally when you're in an airplane, you can listen to COM1, COM2, the co-pilot, and three passengers, but they all just sound together. It all comes from the same place. You hear them in both headsets. There's an incredible YouTube uh, video, and the address is here. You can take a second and write that down. Or if you just go to YouTube and search for Garmin 3D Audio, this will pop right up. It's really an amazing demonstration of this technology. With 3D Audio turned on, COM1 always sounds in the left ear. The co-pilot and COM2 sound in the right ear. And the passengers seem to be coming from behind you in the right ear. It's the way you hear in real life and it really helps you distinguish and prioritize what's the most important thing to listen to. It's a very neat and a very neat thing and I encourage all of you to try it out at Oshkosh Air Venture, whatever air shows you're at. And if you're a, a real Garmin fan, this is just one of the things I would absolutely get. Radio and nav radio frequencies. The easiest one is the one you're probably most familiar with. Simply turn the bottom right knobs. The little knob changes little numbers. The big knob changes big numbers. So if I wanted to put in a frequency of 120.5, I can just turn the little knob to 0.5 and change the big knob to 120.5. Touch the top frequency and 120.5 Long Beach Tower is now active. You can also type in frequencies. If I touch the standby frequency, I can type in 133.0, hit enter, and there's Long Beach Ground. Now that I've landed, 
I can make that active, but I need to get the Long Beach ATIS before I depart on another IFR flight. I can also look it up. So if I touch the home button, scroll up to waypoint, touch airport, Long Beach is already selected, touch frequency, you'll notice ATIS is right at the top, but you can also scroll up and down. If I touch ATIS, that'll make it active. Or put it in standby rather. Then I touch the top frequency, or I can press and hold that bottom right knob. I'll try that again. If I press and hold it, that'll do a flip flop for me. Now, what I just did by accident is the next thing. If I want to touch it once, that brings up my nav radio. Same thing. Little knob, big knob. There's Pomona VOR. I can make it active. I can also simply touch the standby frequency and type in 115.7, and that will find Seal Beach, which I can make active, or I can look it up. So if I touch Home, scroll up again to Waypoint, Type in VOR, touch where it says Paradise, and let's look up uh, Victorville. So if I scroll or just touch close to the V, touch V, touch close to the C, and look, Fast Find says, look, you're near the Victorville VOR. If I touch that, and then touch frequency. Now you'll notice that it's gone back to radio. No problem. The second you touch 109.05, it'll go back to now. So to listen to the nav radio is pretty simple. If we drag my screen over a little bit, you'll see the Daggett VOR. I'm going to touch that once, I'm going to touch Waypoint Info, and I'm going to touch the frequency 113.2, and it says WX, the Daggett VR actually has high was recorded on it. So I'm going to touch that, touch the top frequency to flip and make Daggett VR active, then I'm going to touch my audio panel, and I'm going to turn on Nav 1. Zero, zero, Zulu. Mountain obscuration for California. Mountains obscured by clouds. Mist. Air you can hear the ident and high was. So the transponder, remote panel transponder, worked pretty simple. There's the active transponder selection. Planes, especially ones that go into the flight levels, often have two different transponders. So they're saying transponder one is working. The active transponder is shown on the top, and there's always an ident key. Off to the right, you'll notice the transponder code key, code display in mode. So it's 1200 on, but not in altitude mode. Every time you see the little green R, that's a reply light. There's a squat code backspace key, a way to go 1200 very quickly, a way to type in codes, which mode is active, and other important stuff. And those mode keys are always controlled on the bottom. Using the transponder on the 650, pretty darn easy. You'll notice the transponder code is right here. So if I touch that, I can say VFR, which automatically goes to 1200. I can change the mode from standby to on to altitude reporting. At most towered airports, uh, especially Class Charlie and Bravo, they want you even on the ground to always be reporting in mode C or altitude mode. Of course, at mode Z and uh, or class C 
and Class Bravo Airport, you'd have a unique transponder of 3213. We'll say enter. If you want to ident, all you have to do is touch the transponder button and again touch ident. The only time while flying that you would ever turn it to standby, which is essentially off, or on only, if we touch mode, is if they're having a problem with your altitude reporting or mode C, they might say, turn off your mode C, so you're still reporting your position, but no longer your altitude. Or if you're really having a problem, they might say, just turn it off. But it's no longer important to turn your transponder to standby once you're on the ground. Now the other thing I really want to talk about is that R, that reply light. It's a common misconception that if you're getting a reply light, the controller you're talking to sees you. That's pretty much 100% wrong. It just means somebody saw you. Was that an airliner going overhead with TCAS? Was it the military jet going by you because you got too close to the restricted area? Was it a completely different sector or a military controller or even just a towered airport controller? All an R, a reply light on any transponder means is that somebody's radar beam hits you. It doesn't mean the person you're talking to sees you. So we've seen a lot of pilots over the years argue with SoCal Approach saying, but I get a reply light. It means absolutely nothing. It just means somebody sees you, not necessarily the guy you're talking to. Using the keyboard feature on the 650 just takes a little bit of practice. Let's touch flight plan. Let's touch add waypoint. And let's say I want to put in the Santa Monica VOR. I have to touch the bottom scroll bar near the S and then touch the S. Then I have to touch the bottom scroll bar near the M and then touch the M. Fast Find will say, hey, there's Santa Monica and I can use that. So using the scroll bar, sometimes you have to touch everything twice, but Fast Find will try and cut that down for you. Let's try another one, and I want to go to the Santa Ana Canyon waypoint, which is Victor Papa Lima Sierra Alpha. So I have to touch the V and then V. The Papa on the bottom and then the Papa on the top. The L on the bottom, the L on the top the S on the bottom, the S on the top, and then you'll see it says, it fills in VPLSA. I can now just hit enter and confirm that. So there's fast find and then it will try and enter stuff for you as well and that's how you use the keyboard on the Garmin 650. So the 750, of course, has a full-size keyboard. The reason they do that on the 650 is just because it's a much smaller screen. Now I do have some tips if you're flying with dual GTNs. Hopefully you've got both. The way I like to train people to fly in the GTN is I always keep the 750 on the map screen and I always keep the 650 on the flight plan screen. That way I can get to things quickest and that's just one of my personal preferences. So we're 45 minutes into a five and a half, six hour program. At least I hope you can tune a radio, work a transponder, and do a basic direct to or quick flight plan. But how do you really get good at the GTN? Well, read the pilot's guides. They're free online from Garmin. Go through with a red pen, a pink highlighter, like I do. Take lots of notes. Practice at home on the simulator. And the simulator for the iPad is actually really great, and it's free. To download the simulator, just go to the App Store. 
search GTN the Garmin GTN trainer touch download and let it install once you have it open you can then change the simulator from the 750 to the 650 like to change your simulator from a GTN 750 to a GTN 650 it's pretty easy touch the home button go to settings scroll up on the left until you see GTN trainer touch that then to change device to 650. Go to home, find your GTN trainer again, activate it, and you'll notice it now becomes a 650. If you'd like even more help, please visit pilotsafety.org. We have one page entirely dedicated just to Garmin. We have free videos and free articles, answers, and questions. You can also click on Ask the Experts and send me a question. Be happy to answer simple questions. I always get back to people within one or two days. If you want to really become great, if you just you want to know everything about GTNs and everything about how to use it, especially in IFR, that's actually what I do for a living. Everything I do for pilot safety, I, I do for free as a volunteer. How I make money is I own a company called MasterFlightTraining.com and I'll actually come out to you and in three days do a really intense course where you'll feel so much better about GTNs and feel so much better about your IFR skills, especially in emergency situations. So in three days, we're going to cover quite a bit. We're going to do over 20 instrument approaches and cover all of this stuff. The advantage to having me come out is we're going to do all of this in your airplane at your airport. I'll go anywhere in the United States and I'm just a, a low flat fee of $3,800. So if you'd like me to come out, go on over to masterflighttraining.com. Besides that, wait, we've got four more chapters coming up. Let's go on to chapter two now, which is all about the map settings, weather, traffic, and a bunch of other neat stuff. I'll see you in chapter two. Thanks for listening.